But time presses. I've probably gone on too long, Martin. I've almost finished. Let me dismount from that particular hobby horse and try to pull these thoughts together by way of a conclusion. Yes, there are traditional ways of understanding and developing leadership. The qualities approach and the functional approach are but two. But in today's more complex environment in both the business space and the battle space, I believe there needs to be more. I contend that the leader needs to analyze very carefully at any moment in time what he is trying to do and at which of those three levels of leadership. The strategic analysis, the operational decision-making and the tactical delivery levels of activity make different demands on the leader, and he needs to know this and understand the differences and what he is doing at any moment in time. Moreover, in my view, he needs to have done his own homework, become crystal clear what he wants to achieve, because he can then very clearly articulate his intent. And it's that statement of intent which provides the focus for the sensible delegation of tasks and his or her framework for appropriate supervision and the foundation of motivation, which is at the heart of delivery. But what really gives the leader his authority, his right to lead, does at the end of the day come down to him or her as a person, the nature of their character and the degree of, the of, of their integrity. And this, I think, is very different from image. In my book, character defines the person and answers the question as to whether this is someone to emulate or to follow and with what enthusiasm. Moreover, integrity establishes the moral baseline to, read, to, to lead. Is this someone who can be trusted? Is this someone whose instructions are honorable? Is this someone to commit to? Do they really have legitimate interests at heart? Or is this person simply a self-seeker or purely interested in the bottom line? These are all judgments for the subordinates, the employees, the followers, the voters to make. Their judgments, I submit, will ultimately define success or failure in the enterprise, perhaps not in the short term, but certainly in the medium and long term. So in these turbulent times and turbulent times for our nation, it's quite clear that in our business, political, military, and community lives, confident leadership is needed. But who has an understanding of the differences between the strategic, the operational, and the tactical levels of problem solving? Who has a clear understanding of moral responsibility for the ownership of decisions taken? And who have characters that excite and the degree of integrity that invites commitment to the finish? I believe we need these people right across our public, private, and voluntary sectors. And so to finish on a parochial note, I believe the Windsor Leadership Trust has a huge role in bringing these people forward. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your participation. And I look forward to our discussions. Thank you. Richard, uh, marvelous uh, material for us to explore there uh, together over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, I must start by putting on my own journalistic hat and uh, asking you about the events of the last uh, 24 hours. Um, can, you, can you tell us the circumstances, and you haven't, you haven't revealed this before, can you tell us the circumstances under which you were offered a job with the Conservative defence team and the position in the House of Lords? How did it happen? Has it been building up for some time? Um, well, um, integrity and honesty are things that we pedal very hard in the Windsor Leadership Trust. So I'll give it to you absolutely straight. Um, I took 10 days, two weeks holiday. We were up in Scotland fishing. I was standing in the River Spey with a 15-foot rod and about 30 metres of line out, expecting a call from David Cameron because his office had rung. But it was a bit late, so I'd gone back in the river not to waste valuable fishing time. And I was up to about there in the river when my blackberry burbled. And I took a phone call, and it was David Cameron, who I don't know very well. We've, we've met on a couple of occasions. Um, we, we both lived in Kensington and go to the same church periodically, just occasionally for us when, when we're in London. And, um, and we had had a couple of substantive discussions over the last 12, 18 months or so. And he put it to me that uh, he was concerned that his defence team, at a time when defence was really important and Afghanistan was really critical, um, lacked um, expert understanding. Um, would I be prepared um, to advise his team? And if the Conservatives win the election, would I be prepared to take a peerage and, and maybe join his ministerial team? Um, well, it was an interesting question to be put to, and I was up to there in the spay with 
30 yards of line out. Um, but because I feel so strongly about these things, um, the answer was yes. Um, I was then quite sort of taken. Um, moved back to the bank quite quickly by a rather bad route, which had the net effect of flooding my BlackBerry, so it hasn't actually worked very well since. Um, but that's where we are. And um, I, I did actually say to him, well, you know, when do you want to get on with this? Bearing in mind I'm, I'm still a serving soldier, and I shall be until the 22nd of November. Uh, he said, I understand that, um, but I'd like to announce it at the, in my speech at the end of the party conference, which is today. Um, as with all things in life, uh, it leaked out a little bit early, but um, that's how I come to be going to do um, what I might be doing. Um, and, and I think, to be honest, it rather indicates that it wasn't a long-term plot. We've been hatching up for a long time. I mean, I so, so, so really, genuinely, nothing beforehand, because, of course, the Labour Party are saying that this is part of a long-term plan and that everything, therefore, that you said in the previous months when you attacked the, the decision-making processes in government um, were actually you doing it as a member of the opposition, as it were. I think memories are rather short. I think I started being quite awkward on some of these issues to do with Iraq and Afghanistan um, back in summer 2006 and certainly in October 2006, which I think well predates David Cameron's time as leader. So I'm afraid, um, and it doesn't necessarily follow that um, if I don't agree with everything that he says and does, that I'll give him an easy time either. Um, what really matters is that we get these issues right in the interest of the nation, in the interest of the armed forces, and the safety of our citizens. That's what motivates me. And you felt that that was more important than the tradition that soldiers retire, who retire wait a period of time before they get involved in the world of politics? Um, the trouble is, in turbulent times, time is not on your side. And the operation in Afghanistan is really critical. That we've got to get it right. Um, I mean, why have I been making a bit of a pain of myself in, in the current government's eyes? Um, you know, if the advice, and we've talked about it publicly, of the sort of troop levels that we need and the volume of equipment that we need and whatever, uh, had been agreed to some time ago. Um, the mission in Afghanistan is really critical. Uh, we will succeed. We must succeed. It's got to be properly resourced. And frankly, if I'd waited an elegant year, that could be a little bit too long. And I think the other point that's really quite important, and I hope we're going to move on quite soon, Martin, to something to do with leadership. Um, um, <laughs> Um, it, it's all is, to do with the leadership. It's I, I, all to do with how you come I, I, to a I, leadership position and move chair, from one I, to I, another. I'm only teasing you, sorry. Um, <laughs> is it, is, it's quite a frequent criticism of political parties and governments. Well, there's no one in the cabinet that's been in the army. There's no one that's ever been involved in operations. Well, fine. I think that's an almost inevitable product of the fact that, by and large, the nation's been at peace for 65 years since the end of the Second World War, bar career, and one or two things. So if those of us who have got some military experience, at least some of us are not prepared to make that available in the wider interests of the nation to government, um, then I think it's rather rich if we criticize that a government's got no military experience. So I think it's, I mean, in a sense, uh, sort of getting towards 60, I might be quite happy to have you know, gone home to Norfolk and, and fished and played golf and that sort of well, stuff. But I think there's an important stuff to be done.